Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with a true legend on the multifamily space. I'm talking about Mr. Ryan McKenna. Now, Ryan is the CEO and founder of McKenna Capital. And McKenna Capital, for those people who don't know what it is, it is a private equity firm that offers passive investing opportunities to its partners through both syndications and funds. And we'll probably touch on a little bit of the difference between a fund versus a syndication. And Ryan is currently a general partner in over 60 real estate syndications, totaling over 15,000 units across the US with a portfolio valued at $2 billion. On a personal side, Ryan has also invested as a limited partner in over 300 syndications, sorry, and he's made it his mission to help share passive investment strategies with others so they can achieve and maintain wealth through real estate and other alternative investment opportunities. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Uh, good to hear you, Dad. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing very well. Mate, I uh, we've known each other for, for, for quite some years now. We've worked together on many different transactions. And it's uh, I was scratching my head the other day and I thought, I've not had Ryan on the show. So uh, it's really good that you're here, my friend. Um, for those people who don't know where you live, where, where are you calling in from today? So I'm in Glenview, Illinois, just north of Chicago. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Okay. Well, and... and I ask all my question, all my guests this question when we start the show. Can you rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid? So first dollar as a kid, I, I remember uh, at an early age, I, I was, you know, wanted to have just my own source of income. And so I, I literally created a, 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 um, a, a sheet with all the chores I had on there. And I put a price tag next to them for my parents and said, you know, if I mow the grass, you know, I want $2. <laughs> if I, you know, clean my room, I want a dollar. And uh, I had to have been probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. And uh, it was just a way that, you know, I felt like, all right, like I could earn a little bit of extra money. And, and uh, my parents thought it was kind of creative. And so I had like a daily or actually a, a weekly chores list that I had a, a dollar amount associated with all the things I was going to do around the house. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love being an entrepreneur from a younger age. So, so walk us through the journey of how you've got to where you are today and, and give us some of the background of who Ryan McKenna is. Did you have a, you know, a, a, a corporate job before venturing into this world of entrepreneurship? I did. Um, I had a corporate job, but I also, prior to the corporate job, I worked in a third generation family business with my father. Hmm. Uh, he owns a metal finishing company. And so I, uh, you know, I grew up in a family business, a very entrepreneurial family, and uh, have always had that in, in the forefront of my mind that I wanted to, you know, run a business, run a company someday and have, you know, control of my time. And I also worked for a, a serial entrepreneur out in um, LA when I first graduated college. And so I got to kind of see, you know, what that, that startup venture world was like. And so all the different experiences I've had, um, I, you know, it has really kind of helped shape where I am today. And I've always had the side hustle. It's always been something I've done, you know, just to kind of get ahead. So whatever I'm doing, I, I usually have multiple projects going on at the same time because, you know, I, I really believe in just kind of the, the velocity of money and, and compounding and getting things started and then, you know, building one successful business and then, you know, creating more from that. And uh, I was able to do that um, with a business I started back in 2006. It was in the sports ticket reselling space. And uh, I bought a bunch of season tickets and, uh, you know, grew that into a multi-million dollar business and, and still have some of it today. Um, but I've used a lot of those profits to invest in real estate as a, a passive investor. And then, um, you know, after doing many syndications of my own and building up nice passive income, you know, foundation, I, I walked away from my corporate job and, you know, wanted to help others invest in, in real estate syndications just because of the impact I saw personally with my life. And uh, it's just been a passion of mine that I think ever since I was, you know, uh, a young kid, you know, just wanted to have, uh, you know, control of your future in a way and, and live a lifestyle that, that most dream of. It's just always been something I've just tried to chase. And, um, and so, yeah, here we are. I feel like I am living a dream. I'm doing something I'm extremely happy about. And, um, you know, it might look like it happened quickly, but it, it was 15, 20 years in the making uh, just with relationships and experiences and uh, a lot of family support, friend support. And then, you know, just, you know, here we are. And uh, I think you would probably say the same thing too about your, your journey. It's, it's a lot of different ways you get there and you learn. And then, you know, I think we're both in a great spot where we're, you know, 
in control of our own destiny. It's, 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 it, you're totally correct. You know, the reason we all get involved in this business is to try and create a better future for ourselves. But one question comes to mind is, did the, uh, did the parents or did the family try and get you involved in the business at all? Like to take over and, and sort of go down that third generation, like you, know, you, you venturing off on your own and doing sports tickets and real estate investments. Like it's, it may not be what the, what mum and dad or, or the uncle and aunties thought that, you know, was the path for Ryan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were always supportive with, you know, whatever I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, before that, you know, baseball was always something that I thought, Hey, maybe I'd have a shot to go on and play at the next level, um, you know, professionally, because I, I got a scholarship to Arizona state university and, you know, set myself up, but I, I had a very unfortunate illness that, um, really kind of ruined my career. And so after, you know, graduating, that's when I, I moved out to LA and, you know, really got a, an awesome entrepreneurial experience with, um, with someone who's now, um, I believe a billionaire has gone on to do very, very successful things by the name of Ryan Blair. And, uh, you know, after a while I felt like, you know, I wanted to, you know, get back home in the you know, Midwest. Those were where my roots were. And then I got into the family business. And so, I spent five years and yeah, I think, you know, at some point it was like, all right, you know, is there something here that we can, you know, turn this business into, you know, long-term because we had a great niche that we were in. Uh, but I just feel like, you know, you got to be passionate about what you do too, even though it was a family business and I had absolutely great working relationship with my dad and my grandpa for a while. Um, and, and I would not trade that experience for anything, but yeah, the industry in general was, was you know, it was a little bit harder for me just to feel like I could grow because it was, it was so niche. And, um, and so I just think that, you know, 2008 hit, uh, you know, every business kind of took a little bit of a hit and it was, it was really a time for me to, I, I think, branch out and, and really kind of go, go, go seek out what I really wanted to do. And, you know, real estate's always been the end game. And I just feel like, you know, I've been able to, to get there um, by doing different things and getting started a little bit earlier in that space. Um, and so, yeah, my, my dad and family, uh, they, they invest a lot in our, our deals too. So we still get to work together and it's kind of come full circle. And, uh, you know, it's, my dad's business has been going really well. And uh, yeah, you miss those moments where, you, you know, you could be with family, but you, you get to experience those in different ways. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, I, I felt like I wanted to kind of create my own path too. And I think mm. that's important too, because yeah, there were pressures and you felt like, okay, like, you know, you, that you, you almost had to take it on. Not, not that my parents put that on me, but you just feel that sense of responsibility. Um, and uh, it was just something that at the end of the day, you know, my, my, my passions kind of took over and um, I just, I didn't want to, you know, limit my, my potential and what I felt like I could really, um, you know, spread my wings and fly in, in the real estate space. Oh, look, I want, that's one what I 100% agree with. And I think so many people feel that pressure from family members, whether it be in taking over family businesses or getting that job or going to university, but having that sense of curiosity to go out and you know, achieve your unfulfilled potential is 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 pretty much what drives us all, right? I've interviewed over three hundred and fifty people on this on this get on the show, and they all have that same inner burning desire to go out and do more and be more. So it takes all the guts to do that because you could have you could have probably coasted along with the family biz, right? You could have just had had it easy, but you wanted to challenge yourself to be more and do more. So I think that that's kudos to to you and and a real example of how people can, you know throw caution to the wind because you probably did have a safety net there that you could have just, you know, yeah. clipped a ticket and had, had a really good life in the Midwest. And, you know, the rest is history. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's pushing yourself to that next level. So, and I've been witness front row seat to your success, mate. So, um, and what you've built. So let's get into that. You are in the space of helping investors get involved in alternative assets, primarily multifamily syndications, but you've also invested across a wide, wide range of different alternative assets. Do you want to just give me the list of what you're investing in today and what's sort of piquing your interest? Yeah, so so most of my my net worth and investments are in um, what I would call value add, you know, multifamily syndications. Um, but I've also, you know, as you as you grow a portfolio, you look for diversification too. Um, so I've invested in you know self storage, mobile home parks. ATMs, uh, Bitcoin mining, um, you know, food hall, uh, hemp farm, um, a lot of different uh, investments. Oh, I do a lot of angel investing too. So I, I've got 
you know, some stakes in some small companies that, you know, eventually some of those, you know, should likely, you know, pay off. Um, but it's, it's much different because there's no cash flow. So it's a little bit more risky, but, <laughs> you know, that's where you can get the 50, 100x returns. Um, and I also invest a lot in crypto right now and the blockchain. I really do think that there's a lot of technology that's going to, you know, disrupt, you know, the financial space um, and it's coming. And, and I'm trying to get in as early as I can with as high quality of, you know, opportunities as I can, you know, can find. And, uh, and so I want to be part of that kind of new web three that, that, you know, looks like it's going to be created right in front of our eyes. And there's a lot of, um, I think spillover that will happen in the syndication space as far as like, you know, tokenization of, you know, investments, things like that, but we're still very, very early. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's really about kind of just learning to, I mean, I liked the, diversification, but I also like to explore um, new types of investments because sometimes those investments might end up turning out to be a really good syndication that we could put together for our investor base. So I like to try to kind of get in there first and see, you know, if it is, you know, what I perceive it to be on the outside. And I just try to, you know, kind of work out any of the kinks I might have, you know, personally with it before, you know, if we think about syndicating it. Um, but yeah, I, it's something that being a passive investor, I mean, it, it's something I'll do for the rest of my life because I, I can, right? I mean, if you've, you know, it doesn't take much once you have kind of the, the wherewithal and you know, kind of, the, you know, the good people that you want to, you know, put your money with. And eventually as, you know, gets recycled in and out of these deals, as we exit, you know, you're going to be looking for that next opportunity. So it's a really fun space to be. It's, it's something that I, I, at an early age, I just, I knew that, you know, very lucrative and there's great tax benefits. Um, and, and, you know, the cash flow is really what's important too, because it gives you the ability of like, if you want to walk away from your job or you want to have that security of that, you know, that income's coming in and all you're building these great equity positions long-term that, you know, with the tax benefits allows you to keep more of what you make. So uh, for me, it's just been, yeah, a lot of diversification, but I'm starting to look at certain deals where it's like, okay, I'm going to go in a little bit bigger just because of, you know, some of the exits and, um, you know, do a little bit of consolidation, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I it's, it's hard to think that <laughs> my accountant loves me with all the K ones he gets, but you know, it, it's hard to keep track of, you know, being in that many deals, but you know, you gotta be pretty diligent and organized too. For sure. And I'm sure we'll get into that in, in a little bit because we talked a little bit about that in the green room and how you're growing as a company, but just talk to me a little bit more about the crypto side. I, I haven't had a lot of people on the show talking about crypto and how that interfaces with real estate um, you know, we don't have to get into specifics of, of what you're investing in, but yep. from a high level point of view, what are you seeing for those, the layman's out there who, who, who know about the multifamilies, who know about the value adds, who know about syndications, but how does crypto now see, you see it as a, a new vehicle and, and is there any relationship with the real estate or is it purely just a, you know, a crypto investment, you know, real estate aside? You know, I look at, um, you know, certain crypto is, I mean, it's it's the digital version of real estate. I mean, there's a lot of passive income streams you can earn. Um, I own several um, tokens that I stake and, and staking is just basically you own the token and you, you know, you transfer it over to, um, you know, the company so they can, you know, can sit on the network and validate. Um, they call it, you know, validating the nodes, but, you know, you can earn some really nice passive income. So that's a really cool investment because I know that I not only had the, you know, the upside appreciation, but I might be earning 15, 20, 30% on my money on an annual basis, just for letting it sit there. And so, um, you know, it, and I like crypto because it's very liquid. As I mentioned before, a lot of the, um, you know, the venture, capital investing, I'm doing the early stage uh, investing, you know, that money could be tied up for seven to 10 years and it's not liquid. I can't get it out, but the crypto, I, I can find a really, um, you know, up and coming company that I think is very promising. I can invest today and I could, I could sell it tomorrow and triple my money if, if, if that happened. But, um, but the nice thing about it is I can, I can be liquid with it and move in and out as I, as I, as I so desire. But um, I do see a day where, um, and this is already, I think, has the capability, but it's not, you know, it's not adopted yet. But like, just imagine for all of our investors who, you know, take a position, a limited partnership position in, in a deal. And, you know, that money's typically, you know, it's locked up for three to five years or however long until we sell that asset. But if that, if that investment was tokenized, it had some collateral backing it that went in, like, imagine if you could borrow against your position as an LP and take that and reinvest it into another deal. Um, that's going to happen someday. I mean, it, it's already with, with Bitcoin right now, and a lot of the coins, I mean, you can, Fidelity is doing this with all their institutional uh, investors. And, you know, there's, there's Bitcoin mining um, 
you know, opportunities out there. Um, and, and I'm, a, I'm part of one that I've invested in. And it's like, when, um, you know, that money comes back that Bitcoin or the distributions, I mean, you can, in theory, borrow against that Bitcoin very, you know, very easily. And it's very low interest and it's to yourself. There's not a bank involved and that's a non-taxable event. So, um, you know, it, it allows you to hold on to the Bitcoin, let it, you know, appreciate over time. But now I've got that capital back and I can reinvest it. And I just see that happening. You know, there's a lot of big money coming into Bitcoin um, when a lot of the companies start realizing that instead of having, you know, the money just the reserves sit in cash and they can put it in Bitcoin and, and, and really kind of be able to borrow against it when they need that short-term liquidity, but also to preserve, you know, I, I get, you know, with inflation and just, you know, some capital appreciation with Bitcoin. I, I think that, again, is more and more adopted. It's just going to be more prevalent. And I think it will take more of the risk out of it too. Because right now, yes, it's, it's very risky. It's a lot of up and down, especially movement with the stock market right now, but I think it will break away at some point. Um, but I really do think that the tokenization is pretty cool because there's a lot that could happen there from a real estate perspective um, where, you know, people could buy and sell their positions. And, and there's just there's a lot there, but I think we're still years away from that. But But it is, you know, I do see this intersection of, you know, the blockchain and, and real estate investing and syndication investing as well, because once you tokenize something, I mean, you can you can transfer it, you can borrow against it. Um, it's just an easier flow of kind of getting access to your own capital. And uh, it might actually help for some of the deals that are done too. I mean, with, you know, capital kind of coming in from all different parts of the world, you know? Um, so again, I, I'm speaking more just what I see, my vision, you know, this is not any financial advice or anything like that, but it's like, it's a space I really love. And I feel like, you know, we're still very early and that's exciting because I don't think you get many opportunities like this in your lifetime where, you know, people equate it to like, Hey, this is like when the internet first came out, right. or this is like when you're investing in, in, in the start of Google or Amazon or Microsoft. I mean, that's what's, you know, upon us. And I've kind of used a lot of, you know, what I do in real estate. Like I love it because, you know, I get a lot of consistency with, you know, my returns and just, you know, the cash flow. And this allows me, the crypto allows me to, you know, take a little bit more risk. And then when I, you know, make money there, then I put it back into real estate and then make more in real estate, put it in crypto. And so that's kind of what I love doing as an investor. And again, I'm, I'm exploring and learning as much as I can in crypto. Um, but I do see more and more of that down the road where, you know, there is going to be um, when that industry matures more and more of that overlap. And again, with it being digital real estate, with you being able to earn passive income from, you know, a lot of the tokens you can acquire in crypto, I think that's pretty cool. And it's pretty easy too once you, um, you know, get into that space. And, and uh, so, so that's, that's my two cents on, on crypto and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking about it more down the road as, uh, as that whole industry matures. Well, being that you're at the interface of, you talk to a lot of investors, you're, you're actively invested in partnering with, with you know, some incredible opportunities. How do you navigate, you know, what, what, what so the best, with, with the comes of crypto, there's obviously got to be a big learning curve, right? Where are you pointing people to, to go out and learn a little bit more about this space so they can get educated, they can, and they can ultimately feel feel safe about protecting their downside because you hear a lot of the hype in the news, crypto, crypto, crypto. You see guys posting in front of Lamborghinis, you know, all this, all this stuff. But what is your advice to the average passive investor who is trying to maybe understand a little bit more about this next wave of crypto and maybe how it even interacts with, with real estate? Yeah, I mean, I think just like anything with real estate, uh, you know, you can get all caught up in the numbers and 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 everything that comes with that. But I really, I think what's most important is the people behind the numbers, the people behind the business. That's that's what you need to understand. You need to, you know, are these credible people? Are they good people? Do you have access to them? Because in part of my crypto investments, you know, we're looking at the team, you know, and, and their background and who the advisors are uh, on their board. And, you, you know, you, at that point, you're kind of betting on the entrepreneur and the team. I mean, sometimes the product isn't fully developed. And so that's all you really have to go off of. What's their track record? What does that team look like? And a lot of times in crypto, like, I mean, the, 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 the team you don't really have access to, they don't even sometimes put their full name or their, you know, they might have, you know, avatars of them. I mean, that's where I would start to get a little concerned of that, you know, that, you know, if you don't know who these people are behind it, you're investing in them. Like what happens if the project goes south and you have no way to even find out or connect with anyone. And so, um, yeah, th there are some scenarios where people invest in, in, in crypto and, and it doesn't work out for them. And so for me to limit my risk, I really, you know, I'm all about, you know, high quality projects, great teams. And, uh, you know, so I do my due diligence. I, 
I do a lot of research at night on crypto. It's kind of like what I do for fun because it gives me a little break from all the real estate, which I absolutely love, but it's just something that, you know, I'll casually do. And then I, you know, you pick up and you learn from others and I'm involved in a lot of different crypto groups. Um, so we share ideas and uh, I follow a lot on Twitter. And so I'm always kind of looking and exploring, but, but yeah, really it comes down to the people, the teams that are backing it. And a lot of times, you know, you'll see on a website, like who's funded or who's a partner. And there's some big venture capital firms in some of this, you know, some of this crypto that like, you know, if you've got 20 VCs invested in it already, I mean, clearly they've done some due diligence to, to be able to put you know money in there and their name on their website. Um, so that, that gives me hope in, you know, is kind of checking the box for certain things that I'm looking for. Um, and then, you know, market cap is really big looking at, you know, the potential, um, just the growth, the sector. I mean, there's a lot in crypto with gaming, like these, you know, play to earn where, you know, there's certain countries, like I saw an article like in the Philippines where, you know, a lot of people there, they're making more money playing these play to earn games where they just get good at it and they can earn crypto than they are in their job that they're doing on a full-time basis. That's just, you know, and they're in these, some of these countries where their, their income you know, potential is, is severely limited by, you know, the government and, and here they can access the entire world through, through a crypto game and get good at it and earn, you know, real money that can, you know, you can earn in crypto and then convert it to whatever currency they want. And I think that's pretty cool to see that. And, and that's just, you know, one aspect of, you know, of, of change that I, that I see is coming. And um, yeah, I think the, the days of having to wait three days for an ACH to clear, you know, crypto will solve that. It'll take three seconds, you know, like, and, 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 and cost way less. And so like, those are some of the cool innovations that I think we'll all appreciate. Um, and so, you know, it's just a matter of time, but, you know, I know there's a lot of regulation around it that has to, you know, everything has to be checked out and, and made sure that it's all legit, but just some of the, the technology that's coming and, and the smart people. I mean, a lot of people I see leaving Silicon Valley to get into crypto and the blockchain because, you know, the opportunity, um, you know, you talk about those guys that are, that are, you know, flashing, you know, money and Lamborghinis around. I mean, some of these people truly were, you know, three years ago working, you know, uh, bagging groceries, you know, at a grocery store. And now they're worth a hundred million dollars. I mean, it's, 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 that's, that's what's happening. Not, not it's all the time, but there are those stories that I, that I see and hear. And, and it's, you know, so for me, it's kind of like, all right, I, I, I do this more for, you know, the upside investment I'm taking on more risk, but I'm going for some moonshots, you know, and, and I have my real estate where I have my consistent long-term, you know, wealth that I'm accumulating. And this is more of the venture, you know, smaller bucket that I'll, I'll take investments in. No, that's, I think it's incredible and something I want to definitely learn more about myself as a, as a potential passive investor in the future. So I'll have to talk to you a little bit offline about yeah. what you what you got going on. But um, how have you seen in the years that you've been involved in the real estate investments and, and moving back to the physical real estate now, yeah. like where we are right now, like you, you've, you've been involved in very similar deals that I've been involved in. I think we've been involved in the same deals, both on uh, personally, but also as, yeah. as limited partners and uh, back in the day. With valuations and where they're going, what are your sort of two cents or your your heartbeat says about where we are in the market today on a valuation perspective in terms of rents, in terms of multifamily, and how that compares to say maybe maybe some of your other alternative assets that I know you're also invested in self storage. I think you're also invested in, in in car washes and all this sort of good stuff. So maybe give us you know break it. There's a lot of questions in there, but but where have you seen it come from, and then where do you think you, it's it's going? Yeah, I mean, I would say kind of across the board, I, I, I see valuations as, as being somewhat high. I mean, in, in almost every industry, I mean, um, but real estate in particular. Um, but what I see is, is that the fundamentals are still very strong. And um, I, I read an article the other day by an economist that was talking about, um, you know, just that the high retention rate on, on, on rental renewals. And a lot of this, you know, the... Um, you know, a lot of people are making more money today. And so they can afford, you know, the, the, the renter that is, you know, renewing the lease and we're, we're seeing a significant increase. I mean, their, their income is rising too. So they're able to afford, you know, a lot of the apartments that we're doing. And so, you know, th those, those, those new leases are being absorbed um, at a pretty good clip. And, and so it's not like we're in a scenario where, you know, tenants are getting priced out from where, what they can afford and what they want. Cause a lot of the renters, you know, it's by choice. They want to live in, have flexibility. Um, but I see, you know, still a pretty strong runway, you know, definitely for the next couple of years. Um, obviously, no one knows for sure and things could change. But, you know, my outlook is, you know, I, I take a long term view in real estate and it's still very bullish because, you know, at the end of the day, 
everyone needs a roof over their head. Everyone needs shelter. And, you know, what we saw going through a global pandemic with COVID, it was, you know, behind, you know, food, I think housing was was number two and, and people right. paid their rent for the most part that, that that could pay their rent. I mean, obviously there are situations where some some couldn't, but that was a pretty good testament to why we love multifamily value add, you know, real estate, um, just because you know, it held up really well, it weathered that storm. And we went through a global pandemic. And yeah, it, early on, you know, it was kind of scary because no one knew what this even was. It's not like we were underwriting deals for, for COVID. Um, but we got through it. And um, I think we came out even stronger. And like, that is, is a really good feeling. And um, and so I think we just saw more and more capital pour into multifamily um, just because it did so well. Um, so I still think that there's a lot of capital out there and, you know, yes, interest rates will rise, but historically real estate has been a good hedge for that. And, you know, when you have, you know, interest rates rising, it makes it harder for your, your, your tenant base to afford a mortgage on a new home. So it almost suppresses them in a way to, to, to rent longer. Um, so I still think long-term, yeah, we're going to see a lot of continued growth, but, you know, I, even if it does slow down, I, I think people just kind of have to adjust their expectations and that's okay. I mean, that's, it's not going to go on forever. Um, and I hope when we have, you know, a, you know, a, a slow turnaround, you know, if we, if we do kind of hit a point where, you know, things need to kind of come back a little bit. Um, but another thing I, I like about multifamily real estate is that, you know, we get to kind of choose when we want to exit. So just for example, like going back to COVID, when we, you know, uh, we're, we're looking to sell, we had four or five properties that were ready to, to sell, but COVID hit and we said, all right, you know what, we don't want to sell in a down market let's hold on. And we wrote it out, which is the nice thing you can do when you, you're cash flowing these assets. And then the following year, you know, we turned around and we were able to sell these assets and we were getting millions of dollars more over asking because it was a healthier time. You had a lot of people, you know, that were outbidding each other. And so having more of the control of when you exit and how you exit, I think really matters. And it's, it's pretty cool to see that, you know, we're able to do that if you, you know, can get it in a conservative investment and, and you can operate it well. Um, it, you just have more options when, you know, you want to you know, choose to kind of deliver those returns to your, back to your investors. Oh, I, I love that. And that's so important about understanding what you're getting into and, and, right, and making sure you're getting into an investment that can ride out downturns because no one ever thought about the pandemic was going to come. We don't, I know looking at five years ago, when you're underwriting for a five-year projection, no one was ever thinking, oh, there's going to be a pandemic in, uh, in 2020. So yes. uh, I think there's really good lessons for all of us in, in involved and have, have weathered the storm. If you can weather the storm through investing in, in, in good real estate, i.e. multifamily, because it covers your basis, then if you can you can hold out through those downturns and you will be able to profit on the other side, which is what we're seeing right now. Mate, but we're coming to the end of the show. I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have a hard stop here in a little bit, but what have you got planned for 2022 and beyond? It's a great question because <laughs> right now it feels like, uh, you know, day to day, we're just trying to keep up with um, everything we got going on, which, uh, which is a good problem to have, but, you know, definitely want to get ahead and uh, we've got a lot of opportunities, a lot of growth. Um, but yeah, my brother just came on board about six months ago. He's a CPA. He's been helping with the operations, finance of the business. And, uh, you know, I think as we continue to grow, you know, we have to look at like, where do we ultimately want to be? You know, what does this, you know, business look like for McKenna Capital? Because, um, you know, I never would have thought we would have grown this quickly and kind of been to the place where we are today. And, you know, I think that, you know, that might encompass, you know, bringing on some more people and just trying to, you know, further automate everything that we do. And, um, you know, just because it, it's, it's been a fun ride, it's been, you know, explosive growth, but, you know, we also got to plan ahead for the future and, you know, we want to be doing this for many years to come. So I, I definitely feel like, you know, we're going to keep continuing to do what we do best. And that is, you know, working with our individual investors. I mean, that's probably where I spend most of my time. And then obviously our operating partners looking at deals, you know, that that's where, you know, we want to, you know, provide the most value, but everything else when running a business has to get done. And, you know, you, you need people and help to do that. So my brother's been a huge help, but I do think, you know, we're already at the point where, you know, we're kind of doing everything we can and, uh, you know, bandwidth gets tight. So, so yeah, I think we'll end up, um, you know, probably having to figure out, you know, um, you know, some additional help down the road and as we continue to grow. I'm sure it could be a whole episode of just that and talking about scaling a business from uh, from nothing. So I look forward to getting you back. But mate, at the end of every show, we'd like to do the lightning round, the top five investing tips. Ready to get into it? 
Sure, sure. Mate, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? You know, I would say I have a gratitude journal that I every day I have three things I, I put in there that I'm grateful for. It gives me that that moment to reflect each morning and it kind of puts me in a really positive mood because it it makes everything I'm doing all worthwhile when you can take a pause and say, all right, this is, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm grateful because I've worked hard and I've been able to do this or achieve that. And so that's just something simple, just gives me good positive mindset to start each day and helps with, uh, you know, with, with my goals as well. I love it. Being taking that time to reflect in the morning to understand the journey you're on and, and where you've come from is, is, is sometimes a lot of people forget that. So including myself. So awesome answer. Question number two is who's been the most influential person in your career to date? Oh, wow. That's, that's, uh, I would probably have to say my father, just with being in the business, you know, just the way he raised me, um, just all the support and my mom too. I mean, she's been a huge help. And uh, I, I think just, I, I couldn't have asked for, you know, two better role models and just, uh, you know, not only in life, but business. And so there's a lot of just, you know, what I've derived from those experiences. And, and I've learned a lot from others too, but you kind of take it and make it your own. But I think I'd say my parents have been there the most and, and giving me the most, you know, influence over the years. Um, so that, awesome. that's, that's what I'm going with. Thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, question, <laughs> question number three is what's the most influential tool in your business? And when I say a tool, it could be a phone, like a physical tool, like a phone or journal, or it could be a piece of software that you just can't run the business without. What is it? You know, I, I would say we're, we're, we're pretty big on, on MailChimp just with, um, you know, a lot of templates we use. I mean, it helps streamline our business. Um, so I would say probably as far as, you know, for what we put together and the content we put out, that's been a great tool for us to, to scale and also to organize things. Um, so that's probably been the, you know, so far, I know the technology moves very quickly, but uh, but that to date has been probably, you know, a lifesaver from uh, for many hours of, you know, manual stuff that, that we would have had to do if we didn't have it. Love it. No, I'm using MailChimp uh, my entire life as well. So definitely if people haven't used it, get on there and check it out. Mate, second last question is, in one sentence, what's been the biggest failure in your career to date? What did you learn from that failure? I would say probably the biggest failure has been trying to do everything myself. <laughs> you know, and, and part of it is like, you know, wanting to have that control and, and realizing that, you know, when you let go of that, you you know, you can free up more of your time, you can help others grow. And, and that's just, it's been something really hard when, um, you know, I've always been driven like, oh, I want to do it. And, and when we talk about scaling a business, like you need to bring in other people, you need to bring other help in. And um, so, so my, my, I, I think I've put too much stress on myself to do it all, you know, my perfectly and, and the way I want it versus like, I'd rather have someone else do it. If they do it 80, 90% of the way that you would do it, it, it and you free up your time, you're in a much better place and you give someone a great opportunity. So that's what I'm kind of, you know, seeing and, and learning, but it's, 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 it's my mentality is always like, you know, I set a goal, I'm going to go out and focus in on it. I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to figure out a way. And I, you know, kind of put blinders on other things. Um, but you know, as, as I get older and wiser, you, know, you learn there's other more efficient ways to probably do it. And, and you got to let go as well. That's, that's uh, mate, you and I both, we're probably cut from the same cloth. I, uh, I'm in the same, <laughs> same pivot right now. Uh, last question, mate, is where can people reach you to continue the conversation that want to be in your sphere? Where do they go? So they can go to mechanicapital.com. It's our website. And from there, you know, they can connect with me, uh, follow us on, on all the different social sites. Uh, but that's probably the best way to just connect, get some more educational content, and uh, we can sync up there. Awesome, mate. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think you know, knowing you personally and seeing your growth over the years, you've done super well with what, you, what you've built at Mechanic Capital. So for, first and foremost, kudos to you. I think the, the other big thing is your ability to look at diversifying and helping your investors diversify into other assets, knowing that the core nucleus of your business is multifamily real estate, but then branching out into you know, mobile home parks or self-storage or car washes, and now evolving into you know, the cryptocurrencies of the world and being on that cutting edge technology front to, to see what's coming down the line. And then hearing about your venture capital stuff, I think 
to me, that's you're really diversifying not only your risk but your investors' risk, and you get to sort of have your cake and eat it too. So you, you get a bit of bit of bit of all the, the best worlds, and you know what your role is, right? Your role is to be a support there. So um, it's, I think it's really really important. And then what you said earlier about investing in people and entrepreneurs first and foremost, and then you know obviously diving into the numbers is really important, but making sure you trust the operators is as a passive investor. 100% like one of the keys the takeaways to, to, to this conversation. So did I leave anything out? No, I think you had a pretty good recap there. And uh, yeah, this is great. I really appreciate you having me on your show here. And uh, it's always good to catch up and connect. And uh, yeah, thanks again. My pleasure, mate. Well, look, enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch up very, very soon. Sounds good, Reed. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from Ryan. If you do want to go check him out, it's mechanicapital.com. He's got all over social media, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, as you mentioned earlier. Check him out. Check out what he's doing over there. It's incredible stuff. Um, all the show, all the notes from today's episode will be on my website at well, as well as readgoosens.com. If you like this show, the easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review on iTunes. And we're going to do it all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave and go give life a crack.